Constituent Education Workshop Series, um, Computer Security, What Your Constituents Need to Know. Um, thank you all for coming. Really appreciate it during res recess. I know you have a lot on your mind with the election coming up next week. Uh, we wanted to put together a panel today to uh, talk to you about computer security and what constituents are experiencing in their homes and in their small businesses, perhaps. Um, what we wanted to do today was uh, employ um, and urge you uh, and your members um, who do have direct contacts with consumers, customers, computer users in the district to reach out to them in every way possible. Um, we want to be able to, every hearing I go to on computer security issues or uh, discussion I hear or testimony I read, members of Congress are talking about the importance of education. And obviously that's one, that's one of the pillars of, of this problem and we really need to educate, every, all of us need to do our part to educate um, customers about how to improve their computer security, what they need to do and what they need to know. So what I wanted to do is, uh, don't take my word for it, but we have um, uh, more experienced people here um, that will communicate that message. But that is the, the general goal today. What we'll do is uh, want to introduce first uh, Commissioner Swindle, go to the National Cybersecurity Alliance Executive Director Martha Lockwood, and then we have a panel of experts that will make a quick presentation and also answer some of your questions. But let me first start off with introducing, um, frankly, the ambassador of cybersecurity, uh, Commissioner Orson Swindle, who joined the commission in 1997. Um, back in recently, he was a he was assigned to the Organization for Economic Cooperation and Development Experts Group um, to review the guidelines for security of information systems. And since then, he's been really the ambassador of, uh, of promoting a culture of security among businesses and, and consumers. So I'd like to introduce Commissioner Orson Swindle to make a few comments about the importance of cybersecurity. Thank you, Tim. Good afternoon. Tim, Tim mentioned the, the fact that uh, Congress has all this outreach, and I'm looking out here and I'm seeing potentially 280 million people listening to us and coming from a small town where the, I, I remember they used to have a section in our small town newspaper which printed twice a week, as I recall, which is more than one time every two weeks, which is like some of our friends in that small area uh, down in Georgia. But they would go around and they would actually write about Ms. Minnie Lee Jones went to visit Ms. Alice Smith. You know, this was what they filled up the papers with, and I know all the members of Congress have this great network of newspapers they can touch. So uh, let's give those people something to write about here with this subject of uh, cybersecurity. Uh, thank you very much uh, for gathering today and, and, and helping us address uh, uh, an extremely important uh, issue. I think it's safe to say that everybody in here uses the Internet, and, and, uh, and we could also safely say, at least from my standpoint, that it's changed our daily lives with email, shopping, banking, uh, research online. It goes on 24 hours a day, seven days a week uh, with all of us, I'm sure. But these benefits, uh, as we've all come to learn, come with a lot of risk and a lot of vulnerabilities and, and along with that a lot of responsibility. Unfortunately, viruses and worms and spams and spyware and phishing with a PH instead of an F is now, these words are now part of our vocabulary. Uh, we've been focusing on the importance of cybersecurity for a few years now. And while we're focusing on it and trying to raise awareness, the threats and the uh, and risks have actually evolved, evolved more, and they've actually increased over this time. Last year at this time, if you recall, we were being inundated by pop-up Windows messenger service uh, 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 ads. Uh, now we're talking about spyware and phishing. The threats, uh, if you're not sure about it, let me assure you that the threats are very real. And so are the consequences, and the consequences can be extraordinarily expensive. In fact, they already are. You're going to be hearing from someone from Wells Fargo, I understand, here, and uh, perhaps uh, she can talk a little bit about uh, what's happening with the, with the phishing stuff. It's just staggering. Uh, spyware, as you all are aware, is software that's downloaded on a computer without uh, the computer user's knowledge. It can change computer settings, barrage consumers with pop-up ads, uh, monitor the computer usage, and then impair the computer functioning. Consumers sp must spend a lot of time and money and certainly frustration in trying to figure out what the heck happened to their computer. 
phishing scams, emails and websites that pretend to be from some reputable businesses and go about tricking consumers into giving their personal information can lead to extraordinary financial loss and identity theft. Unfortunately, these phishing scams work. The Anti-Phishing Working Group estimates, uh, I think just a couple of months ago they came out with a study that something on the order of 5% of all consumers respond to these bogus messages and in the responding provide information. This is staggering, especially when you consider, you know, we've had a couple of uh, workshops down at the Federal Trade Commission where we've invited uh, spammers to come talk to us. They're very popular at these things, and I've also seen them with great popularity in congressional hearings. And keep in mind, the, the, the phishing uh, response rate is 5%. The spammers, these guys that do it, you know, in terms of millions and millions, estimate that they need something significantly less than 1%. To get to, to actually make money, so uh, the fishing things are staggering economic loss to the countries, and virus and worms and other online threats also pose risk to consumers. In addition to impairing the functionality of their computers, uh, they can be taken over to send spam without the computer owner or user even knowing it's being done. And most important, with the interconnected nature of the internet, the risks that are that we are exposed to today are not only to just our own personal. Con computers or the office system, they're also risk to our national critical infrastructure. So how do we address these risks? At the FTC, we take a three-pronged approach. First, law enforcement. The Commission enforces the law against, enforces the law against deceptive and unfair practices. We've actually taken, we've taken action against spammers who peddle false goods and against fishers who use deceptive spam to get consumers' credit card numbers and through those credit card numbers and bank account numbers, they use those to order merchandise or just simply deplete the accounts. Last week, the Commission filed its first case targeting spyware. It's interesting to note that we brought this case against uh, someone, uh, you know, involved in spy spyware under existing law. I want to repeat that. We brought this case under existing law. We don't need any new laws to go after spyware. A copy of the press release is contained in the package on your tables and uh, that Eric, Derek Real provided. And by the way, if you haven't met Derek, I'd like to, where's Derek? Derek's over in here. Derek's our, works in our Congressional Relations Office. Some of you, perhaps all of you know Derek, but he can help you with anything we do down at the office, down at the Federal Trade Commission. In this particular case, the FTC alleged that the defendants downloaded software onto the, con the consumer's computers without their consent. The software secretly changed uh, the consumer's home pages and search engines. It triggered a barrage of pop-up ads and installed additional software, including spyware that spies on the computer's web serving. As a result of this, and many computers malfunctioned, slowed down, or crashed. To add insult to injury, having created all these serious problems, we allege that the defendants offered to sell the consumers a solution. I might add that that's not an uncommon scam that we see down at the Federal Trade Commission, not necessarily over the Internet, but we see a lot of people who create problems, get caught, then come back around and offer to correct those problems to the very people they fleeced once, they get them twice. We also, uh, in addition to our law enforcement role, the FTC holds workshops to educate ourselves as well as others about on emerging issues and technology in particular. The workshops bring together a rather wide variety of groups, often with uh, considerably differing viewpoints, to examine new technology and to explore solutions. In just a few weeks, on November the 9th and 10th, we will be having an email authentication summit this summit will explore the challenges in the development, the testing, evaluation, and deployment of domain-level authentication systems. A domain-level authentication system would help ISPs in filtering out spam, and it would help law enforcement in tracking down those who engage in spam and prosecuting them under the, under, as a, because of violations of the CAN Spam Act. I would strongly encourage you, if you're working in information technology for the member of Congress for whom you work, to attend these sessions. The Commission will also be holding a workshop to examine the use of P2P technology. This will come about in December, I think it's December uh, 15 and 16. P2P technology is astounding technology. It has many good attributes, but like all of technology, it seems it's like a double-edged sword. There are good things and bad things about it. 
Uh, they have vulnerabilities. This workshop will provide an excellent opportunity to learn about the many issues surrounding P2P technology. One of our highest priorities at the Commission is educating consumers. Uh, we have engaged in a broad campaign to edu educate consumers and businesses about the importance of information system security and good information, uh, good information security practices. We all must take responsibility for ensuring that our computer systems and information are secure. We have a number of publications highlighting the various topics I've discussed today. How to stay safe online, how to not get hooked by phishing schemes, and tips to avoid spyware. We disseminate these education materials uh, through a variety of means, and we also have uh, we've also devoted a portion of our website, which under the under the uh, label of info security at www.ftc.gov/infosecurity, to information security issues. I'd like to introduce Aaron Malik. Where's Aaron? Right over here. Stand up, Aaron. Uh, Aaron works in our Office uh, of Consumer and Business Education. Aaron is one of our incredibly talented staff responsible for creating our educational materials and designing our information security website. I might add, this website is a phenomenal website. I, I really encourage you to take a look at it. But educating consumers is a big challenge. For any change to occur, it takes a massive effort of repetition. I was just out in Phoenix this uh, last couple of days uh, watching the World Series, uh, not the World Series, the Yankees and Red Sox fans would probably contest that it probably was the World Series, but I was astounded at how frequently certain advertisements are run. I just, every 10 or 15 minutes, one particular ad was run over and over and over. It just reminds me how difficult it is to, number one, sell something, but to change an attitude is quantumly greater in difficulty than just merely selling another diet product. So we have to, uh, this is where we think your offices can come in. I mentioned the contacts that you have and the outreach that you have throughout the country. Literally, we touch everybody. That's what you're in business of doing is representing everybody, and it's a two-way street, and you can help us convey information. Members can play an important role in getting the word out. There are some easy steps you can take, and the FTC has resources to help. In this folder that's on your uh, table, there's a document outlining five project ideas. We also have contact information, again, for Derek Real with our Office of Congressional Relations. And I'd ask you to please call Derek if you'd like more information, if you can think of ways we might be able to help. Let me highlight a few of these project suggestions. The folder that you have on the table uh, has some copies of publications that uh, we produce. They're up on our websites. There's also a CD-ROM and a white folder, I believe. Uh, that has all of these on it, and you can literally download those and reproduce them. We hold uh, no copyright claims or trademark claims. Please use this stuff. That's what it's for. You can distribute these from the district offices and use them as handouts at local meetings. We also have items that can be included in the members' newsletters. Uh, second point, uh, members can conduct town hall meetings on consumer issues. About 40 members have done this having these meetings and with sometimes with our staff helping them uh, to provide information to their constituents. Thirdly, we encourage members to link to the FTC website. This is a simple process. About 50 members have done so. I was here a year ago with this, with this group and suggested that everybody sign up. Uh, we have a few more than we had then, but we still only have 50. And my question is, why not 435 representatives and 100 senators. I, I find it just puzzling on something as important as information security is that we have not managed to achieve that goal, and I would really encourage you to try to help us in that regard. In the grandiose world of the Hill and Washington, D.C., these may sound like small steps. Uh, I cannot overemphasize the severity of the information security and consumer fraud, fraud problems that we're confronted with. It is important that we all participate in increasing consumer awareness of the risk to computers and to consumers and their personal information. The FTC and other government agencies are working diligently on this problem, these problems. The private sector has committed vast resources to finding ways to combat the vulnerabilities that are almost inherent in, in, in the very nature of information security. And it would help immensely if members of Congress would have a conversation with their constituents about this serious problem. We really do need to make information security a part of our culture. Information security issues will be with us for a long time to come. It is the new way of doing things. Imagine 
if you didn't have your computer and your ability to communicate and write so easily and keep track of things, everything from appointments to communication with constituents and other members of Congress, imagine if that disappeared. And if you get right down to it, if we don't get this information system, security system worked out to where it's secure, we very well may so badly degrade these very tools that we're using, we'll be back in the dark ages, and we don't want to go there. As computers have become part of our culture, good security practices must become part of that culture too. We all, each one of us, everybody at home, your constituents, officials in government and business, all up and down the line, we all have a role to play, and we must, must get involved in this, and we need your help. I would encourage you to get involved. It would be simply stated the right thing to do. Thank you very much. Thank you, Commissioner. Uh, the, the next person, the reason we're doing this in October is because October has been dubbed as National Cybersecurity Month. Um, and, and the next person I want to introduce you to is, um, represents the organization that is responsible for that dubbing. Um, of it being National um, Cybersecurity Month. Martha Lockwood is an executive director of the National Cybersecurity Alliance, which is a private-public partnership focused on promoting computer security and safe behavior online. Um, the internet in entities involved in the NCSA are the Federal Trade Commission, the Department of Homeland Security, um, academic organizations, business leaders, et cetera. And um, Martha has a long history in nonprofit and public interest work, and I'd like to introduce Martha Lockwood. Now, does that work for everybody? You can all hear me. Okay. Thank you, Tim. I'm delighted to be here today. And I want to also thank the Internet Caucus, uh, the congressional support that the Internet Caucus has, and, and all of you who are here today to hear about National Cybersecurity Awareness Month and what we're doing. As Tim said, I'm Martha Lockwood, and I am the Executive Director of the National Cyber Security Alliance. Commissioner Swindle, thank you for your good remarks. Um, other honored guests, today I'd like to tell you a little bit about the Alliance, how we came to be and who we are, the problems that we have in reaching a more comfortable level of cybersecurity, and what the Alliance and others are doing to address this growing problem. But first, I'd also like to tell you why you should even care about breaches in cybersecurity. And that is simply because it affects every American student, business, and household. In short, it affects every one of your constituents, and that's not in a good way. The National Cybersecurity Alliance came into being in the year 2002 when a group of what I think are very forward-thinking companies, true leaders in, this, in cybersecurity, came together. A lot of them are competitors, so there, there's a tremendous spirit of making things work. They came together and decided that it was time for the industry that had come to be because of the Internet, the web, and widespread com computer use, to make the cyber community a safe and con convenient place to learn, to communicate, to shop. In short, life on the internet shouldn't be a hassle, but it also shouldn't be the weakest link in our national security. I'm going to give these seven companies a plug. If any of, them, any of your representatives are here today, I'd love to have you stand up, uh, because these, if, Back in 2002, everybody just ponied up a bunch of money to make sure that this had the seed money to go forward. AOL Time Warner, Bell South, Cisco Systems, McAfee, Microsoft, RSA Security, and Symantec. Thank you. <laughs> These companies, as I said, they're competitors. They put up the money. They got the alliance together. They went so far as to get a 501c3 designation. We are a true charity. And they hired staff, me, one. They have also been very actively involved in tracking the problem and addressing appropriate solutions. And as we move forward, let me tell you, 
that the National Cybersecurity Alliance is a true public-private par partnership, as Commissioner Swindle said. We promote commuter, computer safety and responsible behavior online. That's it. We don't sell anything. We're about, we're about education. We're about behavior. Great to have a mandate like that. What are you doing? Well, we supply the tools and the resources to empower your constituents. Again, our specific audiences are home users, small businesses, and schools and universities. And we've got the tools and resources to help you all stay safe online. If you go to our website on the World Wide Web, staysafeonline.info, and I emphasize the .info, you will find many of those tools and resources listed within the various audience sections as the, on, the, on that particular site, as well as our, we like to say, top 10 tips for staying safe online. Very basic, very basic things to do. They're also in our brochure, and there we'll have these out later for everybody to, to grab hold of. Um, the next thing that these forward-thinking leaders did is they went back to the government and to the Department of Homeland Security and secured $650,000 for us to use this fiscal year as we go forward. Wonderful. Let's take a look at what we learned, though, along the way. Just recently, AOL did a study in conjunction with us. We went into 329 households in 22 different communities throughout the contiguous 48 states. Um, these were in-person, in-home interviews and technical analysis. Took place during the three weeks of September 15th to October 18th. And the information I'm going to give you will not be released to the media until Monday, but I really wanted to give you a head, heads up. Also, the um, households were about two-thirds broadband, one-third dial-up. And as I said, there were more in more than 22 towns and cities throughout the contiguous 48. First thing was to um, the participants were assessed of their understanding and awareness of the issue. And I'll get to those results in a minute. And then second, as part of this, their computers were assessed to determine firewall settings, antivirus software, potential virus infections, parental control software, and spyware. Um, this, is the, this is the study, and it will, there, this is the, these are the results of the study, and it will be released on Monday. But I just wanted you to know, just from this joint AOL-NCSA online safety study, we found that 77% of the people who, uh, of the households think that they are safe from online threats. Safe. That would be like saying to this room, okay, all but two tables stand up. All you other guys think that you're safe. That's an incredible um, a number of people who think that they're safe. While at the same time, 67% of computers lack current, current antivirus software and one in five were infected with a virus. 80% of home computers infected with spyware and adware, and 88% of that 80% didn't even know it. 49% of the broadband users lacked any firewall protection whatsoever. These are amazing things to know. And as Commissioner Swindle has said to me on occasion, great, what are you doing about it? I'm here to answer your question. Uh, today, as we are here today, um, oh, I forgot to mention one of the other major supporters. It's, a, it's an organization called EDUCAUSE, and one of the reasons they're a major supporter is because they give me office space. Um, they are at their annual meeting in Denver, and there are 4,200 uh, higher ed and university level IT professionals there. And we partnered with EDUCAUSE, George Washington University, and us, the three of us partnered, to put together this that has over 100 tools that the colleges and universities and um, uh, in some cases high schools can use to make sure that each computer is safe online. So this is going to have tremendous distribution. 
Also, today, right now, in, right here in Fairfax County, we are doing a, um, we're at um, Deer Park Elementary School and Westfield High School in Fairfax County, as I said, where we will reach out to 1,200 student households. They have, um, they are, there's going to be hands-on instruction for all 1,200 students as to how to stay, stay safe online, what tools they knew, need, how to recognize that they need this help, how to understand it, because that gap is, oh yeah, I think there's a computer virus on here somewhere because this really has slowed down. And what do I do about it? There's that gap. So we're trying to help them to understand where they go to get this kind of, kind of protection and this kind of help and how to really fix the problem. Next week, also in Fairfax County, I don't know why Fairfax stepped it up to the plate, but they did, and in conjunction with the National Institutes of Standards and Technology, we are reaching out through a breakfast to 60 small businesses, again, hands-on, how you go from, yeah, I think there's a problem, to, oh my God, there really is a problem, to, but I know how to fix it. This is all part of what we're about. It's going to take a lot of time. But the good news is, each one of these programs that I have mentioned to you can be replicated in every, not just 22, every town and city throughout the country. It's a big job, but we can do it. Next week, I invite you to join uh, the viewing public as we see I.J. Hudson of NBC4, you may recall he had a trade show earlier uh, in September, we were there, uh, called Digital Edge. And as a result of that, of our being there, he asked if we would work with him as he himself went into a home and figured out what was on everybody's computer, tell them what's wrong, and we are helping them fix it. This is being filmed uh, this week and next and it will be on, I believe, the first week in November. Yesterday, we had a public service announcement recorded by a man by the name of Frank Abagnale uh, for play on um, throughout the radio world during the month of uh, the rest of, of October, then throughout November and December. I'll tell you a little bit about November and December in a minute. But Frank Abagnale, you may all know him a little bit better, is Leonardo DiCaprio in Catch Me If You Can. And he's going to be speaking very seriously about fraud and what you can do to combat it. Next month, in the month of um, November, Parade Magazine and Microsoft and, am I stealing your thunder? No, no. Okay, okay. Um, and, um, and others, and us. Parade Magazine is going to be putting in, a no they're going to be doing an, an, a, a, a whole series on cybersecurity, and they're going to be offering this booklet that we and Microsoft um, have put together, and it contains resource guides, and I'm happy to say that the FTC is in the, in the list, in the mix of resource guides. We'll have these available. Over 30,000 of these will be available through the, um, the order up in Pueblo, Colorado. So we're happy to see that, and I thank Microsoft for taking the lead in that. But there's always more, and this is our brochure, which we will have available for you, so I want you to know about that. But there's always more that we can do, and so I invite each and every one of you to join with me and the nearly 100, and we've, this has taken us I met just a matter of weeks to get this together. We have written endorsements from over 100 organizations, federal organizations, schools, colleges, universities, and associations supporting National Cybersecurity Awareness Month this month. I mentioned a little bit about, about next month is Shop Safe Online, November and December, going into the, the holidays. So I invite you to, to go further than just National Cybersecurity Awareness Month. Contact us, our contact information is on the back. Um, we have opportunities for real education with real solutions. We want to bring it to the local level, take advantage of the programs that we have in place, that the FTC has in place, 
and make it real as we all stay safe online. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Martha. Thank you to the National Cybersecurity Alliance. Um, sorry, my microphone wasn't working. Um, at this portion, I want to go through a more informal um, part of the, the panel um, with some of our experts on computer security and, and, and other things. I want to first, um, before I do that, I want to just kind of explain in a little more detail the packet that you have in front of you. There's actually a couple packets in front of you. And we really didn't want to inundate you with materials, but um, everybody really wants to reach out. And Martha, we'll have somebody pass out those materials from the National Cybersecurity Alliance. But what we did was, Aaron, uh, Commissioner Swindle introduced Aaron Malik from uh, the Federal Trade Commission, who was up busy last night packing these folders. So I'd really appreciate it if you took a look at them. Um, Derek Rill was also there um, late into the wee hours packing them as well. Um, but let me just point out the two, two folders you have in front of them. First is the folder from us, the Congressional Internet Caucus Advisory Committee. We call it the Constituent Education uh, Toolkit. Inside, you'll see that it has a CD-ROM. And basically, when you open up the CD-ROM drive, it has an index file, which is being displayed up there. It has a few sample materials, that digital files. You can, they're all on the CD-ROM. they are sample press releases, sample cons website materials code to put on your website to, about computer security, some newsletter materials that you can incorporate into your monthly or quarterly newsletter that you can send out to your constituents. These are all very simple to incorporate into your website. And then also, there are these town hall materials that are really from the Federal Trade Commission as well as the National Cybersecurity Alliance. If you click on the Federal Trade Commission uh, education link, you'll come to the Federal Trade Commission's um, all their materials, which link out to every, every piece of material that you'll need to do a whole town hall meeting. Um, Dewey is there on the right side. He's their mascot for the Federal Trade Commission security site. Um, and you can download all of those within this particular document. There's another piece of material. Um, it's actually click here for the Congressional Project Ideas, Promoting Safe Computing Practices. That is a document that was done by Derek Rill and the other folks in the Congressional Relations Department, and it lists step by step everything that you can do as a congressional office to reach out to your constituents. Um, materials, ideas, you name it. I encourage you to look at that document. A hard copy is in this document, which is uh, this folder, which is from the Federal Trade Commission. And Derek was nice enough to put together, basically spoon feed, a strategy for reaching out to constituents. And I think um, it, it was, it's, a, it's a great document. So I encourage you all to look at it. All the materials you need for a town hall meeting are in here. All the digital files you need um, are also in the white folder that we passed out. So I really wanted to make a plug for those materials um, that we gave you. So moving on to the next portion, I'd like to, to introduce first Wendy, Wendy Tazilar from Wells Fargo Online. Uh, Wendy is the Vice President for Internet Services Group. In this capacity, she's co responsible for compliance over the delivery of products and services through Wells Fargo. Um, Wendy has worked with us in the past on spyware education, and welcome, Wendy. Thank you. Thank you for inviting Wells Fargo to participate. Um, uh, so I think we all would agree that there, there is a problem. And um, the problem is that the consumer's personal computer uh, security is at risk. Um, research has shown that the number of personal computers that are infected by alien software is increasing significantly. And what's happening is consumers are being tricked into either providing confidential information in a fraudulent email or they're being tricked into downloading um, software that compromises the, compu the security on their computers. Um, at a minimum, what happens is their personal computers' um, performance is impacted, or they may be presented with annoying, unauthorized pop-ups. But at its worst, um, computer or compromised security on personal PCs enables the bad guys to steal personal information, to spy on consumers' activities, um, to invade privacy, or to steal um, consumers' identities. And that is really why it's important that we take action. Um, when users' uh, computer security is compromised, there's a possibility that personally identifiable information can be unknowingly transmitted through a virus, a worm, or spyware. Um, there's a need for action, but there's really a limit to what financial institutions can do on their own. Um, we really need assistance from 
consumers, from the public, and from legislators. Um, and your continued support as we um, fight this fraudulent activity is really appreciated. Um, we, we know that our sites are safe and that our security is sound. Um, banks make security a top priority, and that's where we put a lot of resources. Um, but the risk is really at the level of the individual consumer's PC, where there are many attempts made to invade or to steal personal information. Um, and financial institutions understand that we really have an obligation to educate our customers. Um, there's confusion out there as to what is really risky behavior on the Internet. Um, we did a survey and found that people thought that activities like sh um, sharing or downloading files, sharing passwords, or providing confidential information in a pop-up or email was less risky than banking or paying their bills online. And um, the experts will tell you that's, that's just not true. Um, so there's really some education that needs to take place. Um, paying bills online with a trusted F, uh, financial institution is safe. Um, but downloading freeware or software or from an unknown trust or trust unknown or trusted source, even if a friend recommends it, is is risky. Um, checking your account balances online is safe. Um, experts will agree with that. But um, clicking on an attachment in an email um, is is really risky behavior. What we're we're all through marketing materials and account brochures and educational campaigns and joint efforts with public um, interest organizations like GetNetWise, um, we are working to educate the public on um, how they can bank safely online and how they can transact safely online and um, visit educational sites and have a pleasant and satisfying experience. Um, and our 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 um, aim is to let consumers know that they do have options. Um, we tell, we, we want them to know that they can protect themselves. Keep your antivirus software up to date. Don't respond to requests for information in an email or a pop-up. Um, a trusted organization would never um, contact you and um, unsolicited and ask you to provide this kind of information. Um, don't share passwords. Um, remove intrusive technologies from your computers. Um, but these are all things that um, are just band-aids. It's, it's telling the customer, the consumers, here's what you can do to protect yourself. Um, but I think the real solution is in prohibiting the fraudulent and deceptive practices that um, the consumers are faced with right now. Um, we need to prohibit the practices that trick consumers into downloading um, software or in intrusive technologies that steal their information. And um, we need to prohibit unauthorized access to consumers' um, computers. Wendy, thank you so much. Um, from Microsoft, uh, from the perspective from my, the Microsoft Corporation, we've asked Susan Kohler to come. Um, Susan is Senior Director of something called Security Mobilization at Microsoft Corporation, uh, and I guess it's to galvanize Microsoft's goal to become the trusted supplier of secure computing for all customers ranging from enterprise to consumers. Um, she's been with the company for over 10 years, and interestingly, in 2003, she was um, information security, selected Susan as one of the top 25 security visionaries. So. As a visionary, we're glad to have you here. <laughs> thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Commissioner Swindle, for the opening remarks and all the ladies and gentlemen here today and the panelists. I want to start out by saying I feel that the industry and all of us in this room are like the Boston Red Sox about a week ago or three, four days ago. We're down and it's three to nothing. And I think that only with the heart and the conviction that they had and their ability to come together with the pitching, the fans, the hitting, and the management, I'd say the strategy that they took, were they able to really win in the end? And whether you're a Yankees fan or whether you're a Boston Red Sox fan, it was a gripping, exciting series. It captivated America. I think our job today is to get that same captivation around educating consumers on these issues. Now, it's not sports, but it is as important in their lives today. What could be more important than their children's safety? What could be more important than making sure that they're aware of online fraud like spyware and phishing? 
There's so many issues that are there before them today, and it's very complex. But I truly believe that the work that we're doing across this panel and outside of this in the ecosystem will truly make the shift that's going to be required. But it won't be able to be accomplished without your help today. Let's talk about the approach that, that several people have mentioned. I'm going to use three different terms because I think it really gets summarized in these three pronged activities. The first one is around some of the technology. We call it engineering excellence. Um, I know that um, you had referred directly to some of the, the money that you're putting against your systems to make sure that they're safe for your consumers. Martha, you also had um, identified some of the work that AOL was doing. But technology and the engineering excellence is only one piece. Education was one of the key themes that Commissioner Swindle used. Education can be done by us sitting on the panel and industry, but to really reach the masses, we're going to need to really work deeply with government. We've already started on that. We're pleased to be associated with the NCSA and many other activities like this. However, in order to reach the masses, we really need to step up our work together in education. I'm going to talk a little bit more about that in a minute. So first was technology, second was education. The third is the work that we're doing together around what we, we call the ecosystem, but it's what we're doing with law enforcement, what we're doing on policy and standards, and what we're doing with other industry leaders, um, such as the leading global ISPs in the world. We actually are working with um, this organization we helped found it. It's called Gaius. And the key to working with them is they represent 180 million consumers. And in the summit that we had um, out at Redmond about a week and a half ago, the top two issues that they prioritized were child safety and phishing and spyware. Now, those were very interesting to bubble to the top because if you think about it, Obviously, from a phishing and spyware standpoint, that hits the direct bottom line as a business, you know, their operating costs. But when you think about child safety, there's a huge opportunity from altruism to step up and to look at what we can be doing as an industry to keep our children safe online. And both of those themes came to the forefront for that group, and we're committed to working through um, task force and certain deadlines that we've set to really make dramatic advances on, in both of those areas. The last point I'd like to make about that ISP work and this work of the ecosystem is, um, is something that uh, goes back to Martha's comments, which people might be competitors. We might have companies that are competitors, but we are all one against the threats that are um, coming forward in terms of hacking in terms of phishing, et cetera. There's a very clean line between what is important for industry and consumers and what the threats are against that. So we're very excited to be working with not only the NCSA, but also um, the ISP organization. So I just wanted to share a couple of statistics that I thought were really interesting. As we look at our products and what more we can be doing on the technology end, um, there's some statistics that, that came to bear. One was, through our Watson data, we were seeing that 50% of crashes were being associated now to the spyware. Um, so th this is directly hitting people's ability to be efficient, whether you're a small business, whether you're a consumer, or whether you're an enterprise, frankly. So that was very concerning. It allowed us to do a lot better analysis and then to come up with improved um, software like XP SP2. For those of you that might not be familiar with the service pack in addition with advanced security technologies, the key there is it was a major milestone of helping computers get the latest safety technology. It addresses many of the things that um, Commissioner Swindle talked about, where he talked about pop-ups, he talked about spyware. And so these advances today are important for consumers to get. Um, obviously, this is at no charge for all consumers that have XP. It's a free download. We also are making free CDs available. And we're real excited to announce that we've already hit our 100 million download um, for consumers. So there's about 240 million users out there today using XP, and we're almost halfway there within two months of making that available. So we're very committed to that technology, making sure we make the proper advances, but also educating and making it available so that all consumers can get as secure as possible today. 
In terms of the industry, the other areas that um, are being impacted is it's not just software manufacturers um, such as Microsoft. It absolutely are the ISPs, which I've already talked a bit about, and OEMs. So whether you're Dell, whether you're Sony, whether you're Toshiba, if you look at where their operating costs are being hit, it's dramatic. Most of a uh, high percentage of their calls today, and it's in the millions of dollars, are coming from consumers that don't know what's going on with their machine because of spyware, phishing, and these pop-ups, and it's lagging and it's it's um, not allowing the performance and the experience that they would like online. So together, all of these different groups are working, um, whether it's through our virus, um, VIA, which is our virus um, alliance, or whether it's directly working with the OEMs or the ISPs. So now I'd like to just take a few more minutes and talk um, about a couple examples of where all these three things came together and we had some good success. Again, the three pieces are the technology, the education, and the ecosystem. So one good example is um, around XPSP2, not only in America, but abroad, we did, we, we conducted what we called like national security days, and it was really around education and awareness, but it was helping consumers get the message. And again, it comes down to the heart I was talking about with the Boston Red Sox. Basically, what we were do, able to do in many countries is bring together government, bring together the law enforcement, bring together our peers in the industry, and bring together the education to, to have a day in which you really push this information and you take a stand and, and force consumers to really get engaged in a different way. And I think that that's what this whole month was, has been about. October, obviously, is National Cybersecurity Month. And I think this year we made some good headway. I think that we've got to remember this isn't about just one month in October. The commitment that we have as a company is not just me sitting here. There's a lot of dedicated headcount back in our office and through these other relationships that we have, like the ISPs, where we're committed year-long to this and making those advances. In the month of January, you're going to see Microsoft and, and others that we work with step up in education in a much deeper way. You're going to see some of the other work around ISPs become much more pronounced. Again, it's only through a concerted, long-term, multi-year effort, um, again, linking those three things, technology, education, and the whole ecosystem, that we're going to be able to make advances in this area. I'd like to close on just um, one last example, which I think touches my my motivation um, day in, day out to really improve in this whole area of consumer security, and that is on child safety. If you look at the statistics of what's going on there, it really is disturbing. I don't know how many of you had a chance to look at the date, date line about three weeks ago on Friday. It, it really was an eye-opening experience for many people. I think the work that um, we're associated with, with the National Center of Missing and Exploited Children, the work that we're associated with working with Interpol, the global enforcement agency throughout the world, in making sure that not only law enforcement gets educated on how to look for child safety, how to um, be able to view the images online, and the steps to take to go end to end to try to put an end to this, those are all very important. And within the area of technology, a great example came up in Canada, which was in the area of Toronto. And we worked our, our MS research, worked on developing some very specialized technology which is now going to get extended um, in much broader context. But we worked with Toronto in being able to identify over 2 million um, child um, inappropriate uh, photographic and video images online. And there, because of that work that we did, not only from the technology standpoint, but working with their law enforcement and education, they were able to make dramatic change in that area, the Toronto area. Um, against child safety. There's also tremendous work being done in Britain. You know, in the UK, they've got um, what I would say some of the state-of-the-art technology um, from British Telecom, and they also have a very deep embedded piece of work within government and industry there. I expect that the United States comes together in this next year and takes a much more dramatic stand on this. Microsoft is very committed to this area, as are the ISPs. And we look forward to working much more deeply with you all in this room and with um, Commissioner Swindle and others because it's a key area in which we can help all consumers be safe online. Thank you. Thanks, Susan.
Um, the, the next panelist is Michael Eisenberg, who we've asked to be on the panel today because he's one of the smartest persons in the city when it comes to computer security. He comes from VeriSign, uh, VeriSign Corporation, which is um, a, a large computer security infrastructure, um, telecommunications infrastructure company. Um, and Michael previously was with uh, Digital Equipment Corporation and their public policy office for about 17 years. So, Michael, what do constituents need to know? Thanks, Tim. I guess to extend the baseball metaphor, Tim asked me to be clean up today, which means I guess I'm David Ortiz. Um, and that's a, a high bar to reach. As a lifelong Red Sox fan, I'm still somewhat in shock. Uh, I want to um, thank and commend my, my good friend Orson Swindle for his continuing role as the acolyte for the American view of computer security. Uh, around the world and taking the messages that have been developed by uh, U.S. policymakers and industry into the OECD and, and into the APEC and the other global environments and making sure that the notion of the culture of security uh, is propagated broadly and becomes the, the theme that, uh, by which we uh, set the bar for behavior uh, both by uh, the industries and users but also by the governments uh, uh, because the if there is a single thing that I would extract from all the presentations today, it's the notion that the achievement of computer security and network security is a shared responsibility that we all have. Uh, it, the problem of user uh, abuses is not something unique or limited to users, and the solutions are not going to be found by addressing them in a narrow uh, stovepipe fashion. The solutions will require the involvement of the technology community, uh, the ISPs, the users themselves, the educational system to uh, inculcate children at an early age with appropriate practices, um, the uh, organizations like uh, the uh, Cybersecurity Alliance, like Stay Safe I Online, like uh, uh, iSafe. Uh, there's a, a laundry list of, of folks who are in the cottage industry of trying to educate about. Uh, computer security practices, all of these organizations have a stake in the outcome, as does the Congress. Uh, but I'd say that, uh, to follow again on uh, some of Orson's remarks, uh, my view of the appropriate role for Congress in this regard is to uh, take a page from the Hippocratic Oath and first do no harm. Uh, the technology by which this wonderful thing called the Internet is delivered is uh, a product of entrepreneurial innovations and some strong competitive instincts and legislation and regulation that are targeted at today's headline and today's problem may have an incremental benefit in the short run but compounded over multiple iterations. Sometimes the, uh, the burden of the public policy process of legislation and regulation may be more than that entrepreneurial innovative instinct can withstand. And uh, I think we're at a cusp right now. I, I was just trying to jot down the list of the various response bills that I could think of in this space the, from this session. We passed a Can Spam Act. Uh, there were at least three anti-phishing bills that uh, were discussed in uh, a subcommittee on the House side. Uh, there was a Bono and a committee alternative on anti-spyware. Uh, there was a judiciary anti-spyware bill. Senator Leahy introduced an anti um, cloning or, or uh, anti-counterfeiting of, uh, of uh, logos and uh, trade dress as an, an anti-phishing measure. Uh, we at VeriSign and some of our allies in the authentication business have proposed an anti-digital um, signature fraud le uh, legislation that hopefully will actually be introduced next year and, and uh, respond to uh, uh, to Wendy's notion of making sure that the, the legal tools that are available and the remedies are surgical but empower the prosecutors to indeed go after the bad guys. Uh, but uh, this is an area that has been ripe with activity, but it has been very much, I would say, focused on the, the headlines. And while the abuses certainly do uh, warrant careful attention, uh, they may miss some of the other areas where great concern still abounds, and that's really what I wanted to talk about uh, in wrapping up. If there is one single thing that the FTC's authentication workshop is going to do uh, in November, it's going to raise the profile of authentication as a tool to achieve security. In our business, we see a continuum between the networks that we are coming to value so greatly. And, and just uh, as a sidebar statistic, I, I like statistics as much as Wendy does. Uh, I, I want to uh, leave you with a, a, a notion. 
the U.S. economy is valued by the Fed at about $10.2 trillion in total economic activity. About $3 trillion crosses Fedwire every day. An electronic circuit that simply clears checks and other financial instruments. Now that doesn't happen to be an internet circuit. It's a legacy private line secure circuit, but it depends very heavily on internet uh, connections at each end. And if the internet goes down, the possibility of Fedwire going down is manifest. And clearly, uh, down for a few hours, you have a couple of hundred million dollars of impact. Down for a day, 3.2 trillion, according to my friend Steve Malfris. Three days, and you've lost the equivalent of the entire economic activity of the United States. Uh, so the networks are beginning to become crucial elements of our overall economic and national security, not just in this country, but on a global basis. And therefore, while it is important to make sure that we clean up the murky corners of the Internet ecosystem where the bad guys lurk and make sure that consumers' experiences are safe and make sure our kids are safe, we also have to look at the infrastructure that underlies that as well. And the tool that links together the cleaning up of the consumer problem and the abuses against consumers of spyware and malware and, and phishing exploits and also protects the infrastructure is strong authentication. The network depends on security. Security depends on authentication. If we can evolve an interoperable system that authenticates users and devices on the network so that there is end-to-end -end trust, so that identity is clear, so that spoofing of identity and falsification is not possible, we will reduce substantially the opportunities that the bad guys exploit. And I'm speaking of every flavor of bad guy, from the, the after-school script kitty and other juvenile delinquents to hackers to, to uh, the criminal elements to nation states uh, to commercial uh, uh, competitors who use uh, uh, anti-competitive behavior and, and uh, um, espionage to go after com uh, intellectual property and outright terrorists. Uh, each one of those may be the source of some of the volume of bad behavior that we're seeing, but it's not limited exclusively to the kind of consumer and user abuses that we've been talking about this afternoon. They also are targeting the infrastructure. They're going after the root servers, the top-level domain servers, large ISPs, large commercial networks. They're going into the networks of large financial service institutions and trying to figure out what the security architecture is that those institutions are using. How do they break it? Sometimes they're hackers or university PhD candidates who are simply trying to get a trophy. But other times, they may be people who are actually intent on holding those institutions hostage because of those exploits or getting financial gain for themselves. So I think it's important that we recognize that the domain of interest of the public policy community goes fully in the direction we've been talking about today, but must also go beyond it. And if we can live up to that challenge and recognize that in companionship with all the various industry interests we have here, all the consumer interests, uh, the excellent work that the FTC has and done and will continue to do, that we will begin to get to the point where we can knock down that problem and perhaps get past this cusp uh, that, that you spoke of, of feeling like we're maybe down 3-0. and oh, uh, but there is uh, light at the end of the tunnel, and, uh, and I, I'm very confident that using the genius that Am Americans have used to bring the technology into play in the first place, we can also solve these problems. Thank you, Michael. What, one quick question, and I have a few questions. I want to also open it up to, to everybody. If anybody has any questions, please raise your hand and I'll get to you. But first question is, Michael, did you say after, after school script kitty? Script kitties. Script kitties. It's just a term. Wow. Okay. I've never heard that. What is it? Can you explain that a little bit? Your teenager, if you have one, will know what that means. Okay. Um, questions? Um, in the back, please.
I, I think the question was for the for the cameras was um, what why don't we have a legislation that would require notice and consent for um, the downloading of applications like spyware I think I'm happy to take that um, others can add so um, if you look at how XPSP2 works today um, it actually will take care of much of what you're describing. So a consumer, for instance, um, will have a very different experience, much safer. Number one, it, in, by default, it's set to a medium risk control, meaning when they go to websites that are at a higher risk, it will tell them right then, hey, you've got this set at a medium default, you're going to an area that's of a higher risk area, do you still want to go? So that's one example. Another example is in these downloads um, that you referred to. So XPSB2 will block those downloads that you don't want to have happening. So in the case of spyware, um, it not only is blocking what are called pop-ups that might not have an act, um, basically a control behind it running, but in the case of where a control used to be able to run, it now blocks that download from happening. And so I think, you know, some of the remarks that Michael was making, you know, I share, which is from a technology standpoint in an ecosystem, we have to stay ahead of, you know, the range of script kitties all the way to organized crime. And it will take not only technology, but it will take then the education of people. The problem that um, Wendy referred to and um, some of the statistics that Martha used um, were a lot of people get free antivirus on their machines. When you go buy a machine in OEM, the problem is after 90 days or after six months, it expires. Most consumers think they're still secure and have antivirus running, but in fact, they don't at that point. That's why within XPSP2, we put a very easy red light, green light, Windows um, Security Control Center in place. We did a lot of very basic testing with consumers, and they, they get that. Okay, and so the red light, green light works as follows. In Windows Security Control Center, there's three things that are monitored there at all times. The first one is, is your firewall on or off? Red light, green light. The second thing is, do you have automatic updates on? Red light, green light. And the third is, do you have your antivirus running? Red light, green light. And then we help them get it turned on or help them push them to the antivirus vendor to get their certificate re-established um, if it's out. So I think there's a lot we can do to address it. Okay. I, Wendy? Yeah, I'd like to add something to that. You mentioned the disclosure um, on if uh, a disclosure on letting the consumer know you're about to download the software and what we'll do. What well, this is this is what will happen. There's a couple more pieces to that. It's not just letting them know um, that they're getting it. Um, we found that um, the annoyware and the spyware that's out there. Um, First of all, people, you're right, they don't know that they've, um, it's unbeknownst to them, it's been let, downloaded onto their PC. Um, but then removing it is very difficult. It's harder than getting rid of fleas. Um, a lot of times they'll rename a file and, and you won't be able to tell by looking at your computer where it is or what it is and how to remove it. And a lot of times once you've removed it, I'm from California, so I like to refer to it as a terminator, it just rebuilds itself. Um, and I think uh, the other thing is the pop-ups that are actually be that we're seeing that are being presented. They're not branded. Um, we know that they're being presented to um, specifically. They, they, they're intending to confuse our customers. So if somebody visits, let's say Wells Fargo, because they know who we are and this, the, they trust us, they may, may get a pop-up that appears like it's from Wells Fargo, but it's not branded. Um, we actually had a customer who came to our website and completed what they thought was a mortgage application and they were asked to take it to a different bank. And the, the person called us and said, you know, why would you want me to bring my application to a different bank? And we said, you know what, you have um, a form of spyware on your PC and you're getting pop-ups that are intended to confuse you. So um, for us, uh, the risk of customer confusion is a significant risk. Um, I have a couple other questions, but before I do, I just want to make sure anybody else, I don't want to jump in front of anybody else with questions. Um, 
we had promised in the invitation to this that we'd explain what zombie bot networks were and um, how they played a role with regard to average consumers, your constituents, about um, having their home computers enlisted and committing a variety of crimes. If someone could help us explain, help explain what zombie bot networks are and what the role they play in um, all these different scams and computer security problems, Michael or, or Susan, could you? Why don't you start? Now? Sure, I'll start then. Um, the way to think about it is. Um, Imagine being way up in the sky and looking down at all these households that have computers. And um, there's bad people that see those computers as um, an opportunity to get um, uh, basically machines working in, in their favor, whatever they want, whether it's doing online fraud, etc. So this term of these zombie botnets is they see this breadth of all these computers that are connected and they want to get control of them. I mean, that's the most simple explanation. So there's a way that through spyware and other things that they can come in and unbeknownst to the, the person in their house using their computer, they get access to it. So there's a variety of issues that can happen from there. They can just use their time, um, the computer time, to call toll-free numbers or um, regular numbers. They can use it to um, deploy other phishing or other spyware. But basically at that point, it's called like a zombie because that computer is acting unbeknownst to that person in the house by someone else controlling it at a high level. And one of the nefarious aspects of it is that it may in, in fact be a, a true zombie and be dead or asleep for a long period of time. The attack that attacked the root servers of the internet in October of 2002 was executed with a file that had been placed months earlier on one particular family of servers a particular uh, model number of Apache network servers and the the bad file, the malware that eventually launched the attack and stimulated billions of queries against the top level domains and the root servers of the internet were sitting there on hundreds of thousands of unsuspecting users machines waiting for a particular clock date to, to be reached and then they became active. Uh, so it, sometimes unless you're a, a programmer who or a, a terribly crazily curious computer user and you bother to go and look at every line of code that happens to be stored on a particular file, you're never going to detect that uh, that is there. That's why we have things like AdAware and other uh, shareware or freeware tools that will go in and, and detect uh, foreign malware downloaded uh, pieces of script that don't belong on your computer and can readily be removed, but you have to know it's there first. If you don't know it's there, you're not going to be able to get rid of it. The, these uh, freeware uh, tools are, are readily available, and I don't know if they're on the, uh, the disks, but if they're not, they're, so we certainly can make arrangements to put have them posted so that they can be accessible uh, to your constituents. And they're quite valuable resources to clean up a, a computer that is uh, continually connected to the Internet. Because uh, if you notice, even a, a perfectly benign experience on eBay for a few hours may result in hundreds of cookies being planted and dozens of, of bots that are searching for perhaps benignly just to be able to place ads up for you. Uh, but if you want to get rid of those and you want to be sure that one of those isn't something that is really malicious, the best way to do it is to use one of the these uh, readily available uh, uh, cookie removal or, or uh, spyware removal tools. I, I have one, one additional question really for all of you is that uh, I've been noticing there was a, a survey done by Greenfield and Associates um, in, in Entrust last week I believe. Um, there was a poll that uh, we released with Dell in the Get NetWise project that showed like 40 percent of people feel less secure today than they did a year ago. Um, the Greenfield study uh, showed um, trust and confidence in, in, in online e-commerce um, eroding. Uh, we're, we're going down. We're going in the wrong direction as far as consumer trust in the Internet. I thought we were at a certain point we were going up. Um, but it's, it's clear that just a lot of the studies recently, uh, there's lack, uh, consumer trust is eroding. Um, all these issues that just, we discussed today, and I think we covered the waterfront of viruses, hackers, zombie bot networks, spyware, phishing, you name it. First, I want to ask Commissioner Swindle, are we going in the wrong direction? Can we get back on an upwards, upward um, increase of consumer trust building in the Internet and e-commerce? Or is this, can we get a hold of this? Well, I, I'm not, I, I know we can get back on track. Uh, it's the nature of who we are. We, we always get back on track after we stumble and fall quite a bit. But uh, 
Um, I, I think the greatest danger that I see right now is twofold. One is the, the possibility of this, this corruption of the system through the, the bad the malware, is that the term you were using? Badware? Well, no, a little Spanish, I guess. <laughs> but it, it's, it's a danger to the critical infrastructure of this country because I mean, uh, Michael spoke of imagine the financial networks in this country down for a couple of hours and the chaos that would create. And as I said in my remarks, imagine yourself without your computer working for a day. We had that experience here recently at the FTC, and seven or eight people jumped out of windows. I mean, it's getting pretty, pretty panicky. The other thing is the erosion of consumer confidence. I, I don't know the current numbers, but a couple of years ago, less than 1% of all retail business was done over the Internet. 1%. That's nothing. I mean, think of the, the possibilities for 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 our economic growth that are at our fingertips with this marvelous information technology. If people lose confidence in it, that's opportunity lost. We'll get back on track, but we will have lost a lot of opportunity. But if we don't get the, get the, get people feeling confident about this uh, sooner rather than later, we're going to see major degradation here. I think it, it, you were referring to a degradation degradation now. But the, the one, you know, there's several things at play here. I think uh, financial institutions are, are it, get back to consumer awareness very quickly here. I contend that Americans can take almost anything. Just tell them the truth. Be straight with them. There are people who, uh, legal uh, people, uh, lawyers for corporate corporations who were advising their corporate executives not to have a privacy policy because that subjects you to liability. Well, that's stupid. You know, that's really stupid way to approach something. Uh, there are people who are afraid to talk about what's happening in the financial business because we're afraid people, what, they'll lose confidence in the financial system. I mean, we can only avoid talking about reality so long. we got to start talking about this stuff. As I said, I think American people are big boys and girls. They can take it. We're halfway intelligent. If we'll do a good job of explaining things to them. And think about this. Uh, those These surveys that we've seen, there are several of them out here now, talking about, uh, you know, 50 percent of the people in the country don't even have fire protection. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, 60 percent don't have a firewall and 70 percent on broadband. Well, if you're on broadband, don't have a firewall, you've got problems coming your way. The point is, with some very simple steps, we can reduce vulnerability enormously. I, I don't know what the figures are, but I would dare say at least 80 percent. That other 20 percent is highly technical. It's going to take technology development to solve. We've got to keep working on that. That will never, will never close that gap in a sense because there will always be something new out there. But we can get rid of most of the things that cause most of us, and that's what we're talking about, 280 million people, concerns. If we just do some simple things, that gets back to making people aware of what's going on. We've got to tell them. We've got to tell them in simple terms. There's so many different ways we can do this. Uh, the congressman can be at home talking to his constituents and just getting in a conversation with your constituents, tell them about the, the safe precautions they can take. You know, when uh, many of the great diseases that most of you don't even know anything about because you're not old enough to know anything about have been eliminated through technology, science actually eliminated them. But before we got to that, we reduced the devastation of those diseases immensely by some very simple things. Infection, washing your hands, mm -hmm. cut into those who died from infection and, 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 and bacterial infections. That's a simple thing. Putting or just using, it's already on the, yep. the software, it's already in the system. Use the virus protection and update it. Now, we'll bake in this stuff to where it's all automatic someday in the future. We aren't there yet, but we've come a long way in the last three years. So. Uh, we got to shoot straight with the American people. Tell them what we're dealing with. Ask them to help us deal with it. They'll do okay. okay well. I'd love to just jump on that and make two very brief comments, which is um, you absolutely have to be straight with them um, or we're all going to erode the trust. And I think one of the best examples right now, I, I help run our consumer website. It's a brand new site that's been up since July. And it's just called Microsoft.com WAC at home security. And the reason why we put that up was to, in fact, do just what you said. How do you make it easy for them? How do you communicate straight to them to say, it's really in your hands. It's pretty easy. If you have XPSB2, there's those three things. Make sure that firewall stays on. Make sure you're up to date. 
right? It's the red light, green light analogy I gave before. And with antivirus, we don't even make antivirus. But because we're so committed to making sure that consumers are safe, we push them right there from our site. We link to McAfee, you know, Norton, Symantec. There's leading fantastic antivirus out there and available, and we want to make sure that consumers know about that. And, and Wendy and then Michael. Um, part of your question um, was about the fear people have of being online, and I just wanted to, to share one thing. Um, even though we see um, the, the trend is upward, adoption of um, online banking and bill pay is on the rise. Um, that said, the number one reason that for the people who don't bank online, the reason that they don't is they, they say they're afraid. And um, in March of 2004, Javelin Research um, published a study that showed that people who pay bills online and do online banking are 10 percent less likely to become the victim of identity theft. And that's for one simple reason. It's like washing your hands. They've eliminated paper. Um, identity theft usually happens because of stolen mail, because of um, p dumpster diving, people taking your trash, not shredding the paper. Um, and so the elimination of that paper trail um, is what is making people safe. So just I, I think the analogy of washing their hands, eliminating the paper is the same thing. So there is a fear, but I think what we have to do is separate um, fact from fiction. Thank you. Michael? I think it's interesting that uh, the vocabulary we're using uh, is shifting, uh, and I, I like the shift, uh, and we've seen it a lot. It's a shift into the life sciences. The vector of harm is a virus. The environment in which the network lives is an ecosystem, and I would contend that the remedy that we've been talking about is better hygiene, and that puts the focus back at every level, whether we're talking about the consumer problem or the institutional or infrastructure problem on the, uh, the weak link in the system, which uh, one of my colleagues at our company likes to say is that 18 inches between the screen and the back of the chair. Uh, <laughs> that's the weak link, and that's the one we have to address. It's your constituents' behavior. It's your, your press uh, director's behavior. It's your boss's behavior, whether he or she likes to admit it or not, and it's your behavior. And the sooner we all admit our capacity for uh, being the victim, the easier it will be to recognize what the task ahead of us is to be a part of the remedy. And I, if we all accept our share of that shared responsibility institutionally, individually, I think, as I said before, Ameri and as uh, Orson has, has repeatedly insisted that we remind ourselves, Americans are pretty smart people. We've done this before. We brought this network into being, and we can make it safe. Well, that, that's encouraging. Thank you. <laughs> um, thank you, everybody. I, I want to make one last plug for these materials. We're not asking you to send out our materials. What we're really asking is to use these materials, customize them, put your boss's name on them, um, and tailor them to your own needs. And that's probably the best way to, uh, uh, to get these things out. And I really appreciate it. I want to thank the commissioner. I want to thank this esteemed panel, Martha, Wendy, Susan, Michael, and thank all of you. And, and uh, please contact Derek Rill or myself or any of the other panelists about um, ways that you can work with getting the word out to your constituents. Thank you, everybody. I dumped